How are you feeling? Seriously, take a moment right now. Emotions are a gift from God and check in with yourself. How are you feeling? What do you feel right now? And maybe more importantly, as we're on this journey together in this Lenten season towards the cross and the resurrection, how would you like to feel? What emotions would be governing your life if you were on that pathway to becoming the woman or the man that God wants you to be, that would enable you to be a gift to other people? Let's dive into taking a look at feelings now. From Dallas Willard's book, Renovation of the Heart, this is just profound stuff, page 120. Feeling encompasses a range of things that are felt, Dallas writes, uh, specifically sensations, desires, and emotions. That's what we feel. We feel warm, hungry, and itch, or fearful. Feelings include dizziness and thirst, sleepiness and weariness, sexual interest and desire, pain and pleasure, loneliness and homesickness, anger and jealousy, also comfort and satisfaction, a sense of power and accomplishment, curiosity, intellectual gratifications, compassion for others, the enjoyment of beauty, a sense of honor, and delight in God. What an amazing gift God has given when he gives us emotions, feelings. Uh, David Galerter is a guy that was uh, uh, named the top expert in artificial intelligence by Time Magazine. Wrote a really interesting book called Tides of Mind. And part of what he writes about in there is what a misconception it is when we think of the brain like a computer, like the brain is hardwiring and the mind is software, uh, he says that one of the reasons why a computer is not, cannot be a person, at least at this point, is that a computer is not embodied. It does not have a body. And because we have bodies, we are able to feel. And our feelings begin at the physical level. I feel an itch. I feel warm. But then they move into emotions. And all that is part of the spectrum of feeling. It's a deep part of consciousness. For you to be a person and to have a mind, he says, requires both a brain and a body. And feelings are central to our lives, Dallas goes on. We know that feelings move us and we enjoy being moved. The term emotion was uh, first coined several centuries ago, uh, real early on in the scientific study of persons when people noticed that there were Uh, muscle reflexes that would move people that were associated. So it was emotion. We are moved. We are set in motion by our feelings. They give us a sense of being alive. Without feeling, we have no interest in things, no inclination to action. To lose interest in life means we have to carry on by mere exertions of will. And the will cannot sustain us for very long. Depression is not primarily sadness. It's primarily a loss of feelings and therefore a loss of energy for life. That's why that is a condition to be dreaded and it cannot be sustained for long. Uh, That's why so many people become dependent on substances and activities that give them feeling, even if the dependence badly harms them and those near them. Such a condition is also the frequent background of suicide. So feeling is essential to life. We must accept this and work with it. And you can be sure that harmful feeling, feeling associated with evil, arising from it or producing it, will eventually be taken by a human being as better than no feeling at all. To paraphrase my friend Dr. Rick, it's like the law of soggy potato chip. Every child would like to have a crisp, fresh... (laughs) (laughs) a crisp, fresh, delicious potato chip. But if you can't have a crisp, fresh potato chip, a soggy potato chip is better than none. We would all like to have feelings of love and joy and peace. But if I can't have that resentment or some kind of high or greed or pride, it's better than no feeling. Dallas goes on. If we are to be formed in Christ-likeness, we must take good care of our feelings and not just let them happen. The one known as the Good Samaritan in the story by Jesus in Luke chapter 10 was distinguished from the priest and the Levite by the fact that when he saw the wounded man, he felt compassion. This feeling of compassion is what led him to help the man and be a neighbor to him. The verb that's used in that story is splognizomai. Splonkno was actually the Greek word for your gut or your intestines. 
if you've ever read through the old King James Version, you'll come across a phrase that would always sound funny to me when I was a little kid, bowels of compassion. Uh, and, and that's the word that it's taken from. So 1 John 3, 17, uh, if a man seeth his neighbor in need and hath worldly goods and shutteth up his bowels of compassion, how does the love of God live in such a one? Or in Colossians chapter 3, I think it's verse 12. Uh, Therefore, as God's beloved, holy and elect, clothe yourself with bowels of mercy. In our day, we tend to associate emotions with the heart in the biblical world. As we have seen, that's more associated with the executive center, the ability to make decisions and govern life. And they associated the bowels more with emotion. And actually, it turns out they were kind of right. Uh, you may have seen studies along these lines. It turns out that your guts have a hundred million neurons. It's the only organ, the intestines, that uh, has its own independent neural activity. If the vagus nerve, the conduit up to the brain, is severed, the neural uh, network in the gut will continue to go on. It produces 95% of the body's serotonin. And so bowels of compassion is what we need. It is an interesting statement in our society that what we have in our day is irritable bowel syndrome. We do not have compassionate bowel syndrome. And uh, that gets into the issue of destructive emotions. Dallas says, did the priest and the Levite have no feelings? Of course not. They had feelings all right. Feelings of disdain, perhaps. Or a fear for the harm that might come to them if they got involved or a feeling of urgency about their own business. And that moved them more than the need of this unfortunate man to be helped out of his mortally dangerous situation. They had feelings that motivated them to selfish action. And they hardened their hearts to any other feelings of sympathy and concern for the half-dead man. And this takes us to a real important distinction, the distinction between unpleasant feelings and destructive feelings. Unpleasant feelings are inevitable. Uh, when emotions come, a guy named Daniel Siegel writes about this, they come in three stages. First, very quickly, there'll be a signal that says, pay attention to this. Even before we know anything else, just something merits our awareness. And then very quickly, milliseconds after that, there will be a general sense of this is going to be good or this is going to be bad. So all emotions can be divided into pleasant or unpleasant, uh, good or bad. I want it or I want to go away from it. And then we'll have more awareness of this is about anger or greed or so on. Now, unpleasant emotions, although we don't like them, are actually very important for life. And uh, anger will give me a sense of justice and energy to deal with it. Um, Fear will cause me to run out of a burning building or avoid a snake. Disgust will help me not eat something that could be toxic or engage in a behavior that would be really bad. So although sometimes we'd rather not have any unpleasant emotions at all, actually we need to have them. Uh, A destructive emotion, on the other hand, is something that violates my values, that leads me towards sin, that causes me to neglect the man who is dying on the side of the road. And um, Dallas tells a very powerful story about the power of a negative, destructive emotion in somebody's life. I'm going to have to leave that one for next time. For today, I'll end with this. Um, The great illusion when it comes to feelings is that the circumstances in my life dictate the feelings that I have. But that's not God's will for you and me for this day. And I think a lot about 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, where Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed. See, I think my outer conditions, how are things going, dictate my inner life. How are you feeling? Things going well, then I feel good. And generally that's the way that we operate in the short term. But Paul's inner life, of being renewed day by day, actually is what drove his outer life, which was one of love and joy and peace stopping by the side of the road when somebody had a need, not shutting up his bowels of compassion. So the invitation for today is just take that phrase, therefore we do not lose heart. To lose heart means to lose the spirit to engage in life. 
And Paul says, we don't lose heart. Not because things are going good on the outside. Outside, I'm wasting away. But because I am walking together with God and being renewed from the inside. So today, see how many times you can say that phrase. Therefore, we do not lose heart. I've had days when I just say that over and over and over again. As often as you think of it, when you're tired, when you're confused, when you're happy and joyful, when you're uncertain about what to do next, when you're angry, when you're discouraged, therefore, we do not lose heart. Living with wholehearted enthusiasm is a good way to feel. I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. There are emails that go along with each episode. And if you'd like to receive those, you can go to becomenew.me slash subscribe. And there you can also sign up to receive daily text alerts. We'll see you next time.